Chapter 4, Departure On Wednesday, Pierre stopped by the school to say goodbye. It was recess, and he was the center of attention. Whose brigade are you in? When do you leave? How many miles will you paddle? As Pierre answered the questions, his eyes searched the schoolyard for Celeste Gouillard. When Pierre finally saw her, standing at the rear entrance with her friends, recess was nearly over. As he stepped away from the boys, Celeste waved. By the time Pierre crossed the schoolyard and reached her side, Sister Marguerite was ringing the bell. Celeste's two friends giggled a moment, then left them alone. So I hear you're headed north, she said. Pierre wanted to say something clever, something she would remember during the long summer while he was gone, but all he could manage was yes. Isn't that an awfully long paddle? It's 2,400 miles, Pierre replied. He wanted to say more, but the yard was nearly empty, and she was turning to leave. Pierre, the thinker, Pierre, the bookworm, was mumbling away his last chance. You know how sister is about tardiness, Celeste said, as she started up the steps. This was his last chance. Pierre reached out to touch her hand, and when she turned, he decided to risk it. If he had the courage to sign up for a 22,000-mile canoe trip, he should have the nerve to kiss a pretty girl. His aim wasn't perfect, but he managed to graze her lips. Then, to his surprise, she gave him a quick kiss in return. Celeste's eyes were bright, and her cheeks were flushed as she ran up the steps, calling out one last goodbye. For a moment, Pierre stood alone in the empty yard, almost wishing he could step back into the comfortable world of readings and resuscitations. Be good, mother, said as she leaned forward and gave her son a quick peck on the cheek. Pierre nodded and took one last look at his little sister, who was nestled in Camille's arms half asleep. You take care of your sister, Pierre whispered, tickling Claire's chin until she smiled. Then Pierre turned to shake his father's hand one last time. Without thinking, father clapped Pierre on the back with his injured hand and cursed at the sudden pain. Pierre looked concerned, but father laughed and waved his bandage toward mother. Don't worry, your mother will take care of me. You watch your backside and keep your powder dry. Up and down the shore of the St. Lawrence, families gathered as all five Montreal canoes were checked one last time. Pierre was sorry La Petite wasn't one of his 14 canoe mates, but his father's old friend Charbonneau was the steerman, and a grinning white-haired man he called Lulande manned the bow. Pierre recognized one of his fellow middlemen, a young man named Emile Duval, who had left school only last year. Pierre was glad to see the scarred man, Belgrade, walk toward another canoe. The voyagers paraded in their finest breech clouts, shirts, and sashes. They all wore new moccasins and elegantly plumbed red caps. The 40-foot canoes were moored in the shallows, already loaded with a winter's worth of trade goods. The gun walls of each birch bark craft were painted with bright stripes, and Northwest Company decorated each bow. Flags hung from the steer, stern poles, and vermilion tip paddles stood propped in each craft. McKay, dressed in buckskin like an ordin ordinary crewman, nodded to Charbonneau, and the boarding began. As Beloit stepped past McKay, he pointed to Pierre and said, If that puppy is coming with us, I hope you check to see if he's housebroken. A few men chuckled as Beloit cackled and slapped his thigh. Pierre's ears burned. He hoped his father hadn't heard. He waded into the icy water up to his knees and stepped carefully into the canoe. He would be paddling for the next 12 weeks. He knew from his father how fragile these Montreal canoes were. Though they carried two and a half tons of freight, their birch bark skin demanded care in boarding and required the men to sit still as they paddled. Too much shifting of weight strained the laced route and gum construction. Once the trade goods were delivered to the fort in Grand Portage, the company sometimes purchased new canoes to carry their valuable cargo of furs home at summer's end. The other night, Father explained, rough handling means days loss in repair, and days loss is dollars loss to the Northwest. Pierre took his place among the 12 metal men in the canoe. Someone on the bank fired a pistol, and the crowd cheered. As the men around him shouted farewells, Pierre waved his cap toward his family and called, Goodbye! His stomach sank at how final that word sounded this morning. 
Charbonneau pushed the stern of Pierre's canoe clear of the shallows. To the north, he called, and the bowman Lalande let out a whistle from his post and waved his paddle overhead. Without another word, the men suddenly dipped their paddles in unison. Struggling to catch up, Pierre grabbed his blade and pulled hard. There was a whirl of color as five dozen paddles turned the river to froth. As the canoe started up the river, Pierre's dog, Pepper, and a few other dogs ran along the shore, barking. Every year, these first miles proved who had the fastest canoe, and as long as they were within sight of shore, the men would pull for all they were worth. Charbonneau's canoe held its position in the middle of the brigade until they were a quarter, quarter of a mile out. Then the fourth canoe crept past. Pierre tried to keep up with the windmilling blades around him. He prayed they could hold off the last canoe until they rounded the southern tip of La Chine and passed from the crowd's view. Pierre knew his father was watching from shore. Each spring, father studied the first brigades to depart. He always scorned the last canoe out as a sad excuse for canoemen. La Petite was chanting an old French song from the stern of the trailing craft. Row, brothers, row, he sang. The river runs fast. The daylight fades fast. Pierre knew that good singers were prized as voyagers. A lively little middleman named Michael Larocque helped the bowman Lalonde lead the same chant in Pierre's canoe. Put your backs into it, Charbonneau commanded. Give it all you've got, fellows, Lalonde sang out in a voice rich and loud like Pierre's father's. Pierre paddled as hard as he could. He knew they would blame him as the youngest member of the crew if they fell behind. Studying Emile, who was sitting right in front of him, Pierre leaned forward with each stroke and jerked back hard, trying to match his pace. They kept up until Charbonneau turned his canoe around the southernmost point of La Chine. There, La Petite cut between them and the shore. As he glided past, he called, Paddle, Grandpa, paddle, and laughed. You'll not get home before the frost if you drag your blade that slow. The men in both canoes joined in the fun. Grandpa, Charbonneau echoed, that's a good one. Pierre's face, flushed with exertion, reddened even more. He swallowed his anger and pulled fierce and deep on his paddle. An hour later, the canoes had settled down to a moderate pace, but Pierre's arms were aching, his back was sore, and his hair was plastered to his temples with sweat. How could he ever paddle 2,400 miles? His father warned him, too, that poor weather could extend the 12-week trip by a month or more. To break the monotony, he counted his strokes. One, two, three. He silently marked each pull. At first, it took his mind off the pain, but by the time he got to 500, he knew he'd make a mistake. Pierre glanced over his shoulder, amazed at how slowly they were moving. He could run that far in five minutes. To cheer the men on, Lalonde and Michael Larocque started up another song, but Pierre didn't listen. He counted instead. When he got to his thousandth stroke, he refused to look back. By the time he reached 2,000, he realized it was taking as much effort to count as it was to paddle, but he kept at it just the same. Just to prove that he could, he would count this day through to the end. Pierre thought back to school, recalling how he could balance a quill pen on the back of one finger and feel no weight. Right now, he would trade places with anyone in his class. Pierre was a boy who liked to curl up with a book and ponder and dream, but he could already see there would be no time for dreaming in this life. Lift, pull, lift, pull, 25, 26, 20. His paddle felt like iron. As Pierre labored, he recalled a poem that sister had him memorize last month, telling the story of a hero called Aeneas, who was cursed by the gods, the poem began, Arms, and the man I sing, who forced by fate, and haughty Juno's unrelenting hate, expelled and exiled, left the Trojan shore, long labors both by sea and land he bore. When Pierre thought about the many years Aeneas wanted, wandered after the Trojan War, he was ashamed to be exhausted after only a single morning of paddling. Demi charged! The steersman yelled. Pierre looked up. They were at the base of a short rapid and had to paddle double time against the current. I said, Demi charge! Charbonneau shouted, tipping Pierre's cap off with his long setting pole. The men laughed as Pierre ducked to grab his hat. Though the current was swift, it was no match for their paddles. The moss crowned rocks 
blurred beneath the white hull as Charbonneau chanted in military cadence, Pull! 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 Out of the corner of his eye, Pierre saw the muscles stand out on Charbonneau's forearms as he planted his setting pole and pushed hard. At the top of the short cascade, Lalonde shouted, Hard now! and pulled double time with his paddle. The bow rose and then fell as the canoe cut through the white funnel at the head of the rapids and glided into a still pool. Well done, gentlemen, said Lalonde. Five dozen middlemen cheered and waved their paddles. Pierre knew if a canoe could be paddled up a rapids or pulled up with tracking ropes, the crew had reason to celebrate. There is no harder job than portaging their 90-pound bales around the places in the river that were too dangerous to paddle. Smart voyagers would gladly paddle five miles out of their way to avoid even a half-mile carry. At the head of the pool stood the little stone church of St. Anne, the patron saint of the voyagers. Pierre's father often spoke of this place. Here, northwest traders and explorers paused to ask a blessing for their journeys. Suddenly, the cheering crewmen went silent. Still gasping for breath from this hard paddling, Pierre looked up to see the men in the lead canoe take their caps off all at once. A lone canoe approached the landing below the church, carrying a wooden coffin. Emile asked Charbonneau, Is that Burgoyne? Charbonneau nodded. One more cross for the Calumet. Pierre had heard of the famous crosses that marked the graves of voyagers who died en route. His name was Amble Burgoyne, Charbonneau continued. He drowned in the upper Ottawa, just before freeze up. His crewmen just dug his body out of its winter grave. Though the day was warm, Pierre shivered at the thought of a body laying frozen beneath the snow. He imagined foxes and wolves pawing at the piled stones of the cairn, and mice seeking shelter in the corpse's pockets. After the canoe and coffin passed, the men stopped by the church of St. Anne to make an offering. Pierre's arms ached as he stepped ashore. One by one, they deposited their coins in the box at the front of the chapel and stepped inside to cross themselves and whisper a prayer. Even Mr. McKay dropped some money into the box. Later, the men lit clay pipes and sat quietly at the river's edge. A few walked off to be alone. This place marked the official beginning of their journey, yet no one looked north. Pierre stared at the dark green hills that lay upriver, wondering what they held. When he finally turned his eyes toward home, his throat went tight. Father should be here, not me, he thought. He closed his eyes and saw the flash of the blade and the blood. He saw the doctor reach from his black thread and bright needle. A hundred times he'd played the scene over in his mind, and it was always the same. He felt shame in his laziness, and shame in knowing he wasn't brave enough to wish the stroke had fallen on his own hand instead. You ready to go? It was Emile Duval, his old schoolmate. Pierre nodded and stood up. Though Emile was two years older than Pierre, he'd been in the same grade. A tough farm boy, Emile wasn't stupid, but he often got behind by missing school during the planting and harvest seasons. Emile was known for his curly black hair, and he had a nervous habit of brushing his bangs away from his eyes. As they walked to the waiting canoes, Emile grinned. Paddling sure beats reciting those Latin poems of sisters, don't it? Pierre smiled weakly, thinking just the opposite. Unless the paddling got a whole lot easier, he'd prefer Latin any day.